Hello, everyone out there, and thank you for joining us for the FSK from Home lecture series. I am Margot Copera, program manager, public programs manager here at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. Thank you to everyone who has joined us today and those who have donated to our FSK from Giving, FSK from Home Giving Challenge so far this year. We have raised a little over $1,000 so far, so thank you so very much for your incredible support. It really does make a difference and has a big impact on our work. Our goal for the FSK season is $3,000, and if you would like to donate during this program, we're going to put the donation link in the chat for you. This spring for our FSK season, we pull back the curtain on our collections, connect with MCHC staff and our colleagues as they reveal the stories behind the objects we preserve, interpret, and display. Today, my colleague, Martina Cato, MCHC Director of Publications, welcomes two dynamic guests that I have thoroughly enjoyed the pleasure of working with and invites them to discuss their biography, UB Blake, Rags, Rhythm, and Race. We're going to get to it. Thank you, Martina, for hosting this conversation today, and I'm going to leave the rest to you. Thank you, Margo, um, and hello, and welcome to all of our participants today and to our uh, two panelists. Let me um, introduce you briefly to our speakers today uh, that we're so grateful to, to have with us. Um, Richard Carlin um, has a background in English. I found out looking um, at his biography, which speaks to me personally, English language and literature. He has a long standing and successful career in editing and music, sometimes both, very often both. And some of the books that we can single out are a number of books on country music, including Country Music, A Very Short Introduction, um, Godfather of the Music Business, Morris Levy, um, and of course, this book that we are going to talk about today, about UB Blake. Um, hi, Richard. Welcome. Hi. Ken Bloom um, is also with us today. Um, Ken ha is, is another multidisciplinary expert with, with a very successful career in um, all kinds of fields, including producing over 70 albums for various artists and songwriters, producing shows in New York, Paris, San Francisco, and Washington, DC, and also an award-winning author. Um, he has written 18 books on Broadway, Hollywood, popular songs, sitcoms, and theater anecdotes. He has also worked in broadcasting um, and directing and writing some documentaries. Hi, Ken. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Martina. Glad to be here. It's an absolute pleasure to, to have both of you um, today. Um, it's, we've had some great conversations just preparing for this talk, and I think our audience is in for a treat because we're going to be showing some fascinating images from this era and playing some music. So um, without further ado, um, I'd like to also mention that um, as a prequel to this book, um, you guys won a Grammy Award for Best Liner Notes uh, for the C CD, Sissel and Blake Sing Shuffle Along back in 2016. Um, so was the book a natural progression from this cooperation between you guys? How did you come up with the idea for, for a book and a book of this size? Well, after we produced uh, the record and won a Grammy Award, we figured, well, as one does, <laughs> as one does, which was so shocking to us because you know we were up against people with multi-disc, you know, uh, CDs with giant booklets, and I personally had no idea that there was a chance that we would win the Grammy Award. But through some fluke, it happened, and so Richard and I had a really good collaboration on this. He had been an editor of several books I had written, so we knew we got along. And we decided, well, we might as well just expand it into a book. How hard could that be? So uh, two years later, we had the book. Yeah, I think you told me that you guys didn't have a single argument during this writing. Are you still standing by that statement? We argued a lot about food, but that's okay. <laughs> Lunch was very important. Lunch was extremely <laughs> argumentative, yeah. That's fuel. That's what's needed for research and writing. Um, <laughs> Awesome. So this is almost a 500 page book. It really is um, 
a, a feat to, to write and read, and it's a treat to read. You visited many repositories and you consulted a tremendous amount of resources in the writing of this book. And one of them was the collection at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. Um, so perhaps this is a good time to either inform our audience or remind them if they already know that our um, H for Long Baldwin Library is now open again for researchers. So all of this material is um, available. If somebody wants to take it up where you guys left off or do some more research, um, yeah. just just to give a sense of scope, um, you know, I, I went to our catalog and I pulled some information. So we're talking about the UB Blake photograph collection housed with us, which contains over um, 3,300 photographs and other materials um, from UB Blake, then the sheet music collection of UB Blake and other composers um, from 1917 to 1979. The photographs span 1908 to 1983. And finally, there is the UB Blake Manuscript and Ephemera Collection, uh, which contains 72 boxes of correspondence, manuscript materials, ephemera, award certificates um, from 1905 to 1983. Where does one even start with something like this? And you know, how did you divide up the work? Um, how, how did you engage with this collection? Yeah, well, I mean, I think we were extremely fortunate that um, both of UB's wives were pack rats, and apparently UB as well. It's very unusual when you're researching just about anybody, but certainly a figure in popular history, popular music, that you can see royalty statements from 1917. I mean, it's virtually unheard of. Uh, UB kept account books throughout all the musicals he worked on, so you could see the contract where he was guaranteed 150 a week and then he was paid $50 a week if he was lucky. Mm -hmm. you know, so you could really, really get granular about issues that often aren't discussed in music history. You know, the relationship of how artists were treated by the producers, the managers, how the actual business worked. And that, I think, was a, an amazing insight. Um, we'll, and we'll get to talk about that um, treatment in, in, as we go along um, in the program. Any, any surprising finds in the collection or any ones that you could single out as your favorites that you didn't expect but you really liked? Well, I always, I always mention that uh, for Shuffle Along, there were maybe 20 or so chorus members, all young, good-looking women. And you we made a point of getting a signed photograph from every one of them. And sometimes there were rather amusing uh, notes on the photographs about mm -hmm. UB's interest in, in the chorus girls. So um, <laughs> even one was addressed to his wife, his then wife Avis, where it said, you know, you know, uh, I feel sorry for Avis on the photograph. So that was, uh, I mean, you never know what kind of material is gonna tell what kind of story. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly there were menus, there were programs, there were certificates, um, and even just to physically see, for example, um, there was a program that he played on right after World War I that celebrated um, the participation of his partner, Noble Sissel, in the, in the famous Hellfighters band. I mean, just to hold an image like that is really... Um, for a biographer, it, it, it's an amazing uh, right. feeling, you know. Ken, did you have any items to sing aloud or? I didn't, I didn't make it down to the collection because the two times I went, there were those weekend snowstorms we had. Oh goodness, that's a shame. I got, I got to Washington, I was going back to Baltimore and I couldn't get there. But wow. I was at the Schoenberg Center and the Library of the Performing Arts at Lincoln Center, who the Schoenberg had a lot of Noble Sissel information, and the Library of Congress we also went to, and they had a lot of oral history type recordings of, of UB and people who were involved with UB. So without, especially the Maryland Center, which has the majority of the stuff, we could never have written this book because people at the time didn't have the interest in, you know, they, they wrote biographies of Jerome Kern and Vincent Humans and Rudolf Frimmel, but the black perform uh, composers and performers just didn't have anything written about them. So we couldn't even use contemporary stories 
that were in books. We had to go to the sources. That's incredible. And what a great way to, to showcase them. Um, something for our, our readers is um, the fact that this book is really, really detailed in illustrating not only UV Blake's life, um, but the, the whole span of his almost 100 years. Um, he claimed to have been born in 1883, but you found that it was actually 1887. So it's almost 100 years of, of life. And um, not only do you guys portray it, you provide quotes from various people. So uh, it's, it's really, and the language is original. There is not a lot of censorship that I noticed. Um, so it's a really interesting portrayal of this time, if you want to get into it. And you never get bored with the story. You just want to keep following and, and seeing what happens next. Um, which brings me to um, you know, how we're going to um, address UB Blake's long life. Uh, we talked about you know, what can fit in an hours program. And uh, we wanted to say a little bit about his childhood and his early years because um, they were formative and you know, they represent something that um, was going to stay with him for the rest of his life. Also, this year is the 100th anniversary of Shuffle Along, the musical. So we wanted to celebrate that by uh, focusing on it and you know, the majority of, of this program. But finally, there are eight chapters of the book and, and several decades of UB Blake's life after Shuffle Along. So we're going to try and devote a little bit of time um, to that toward the end of this conversation, just before the question and answer section. Um, maybe we can start then by, by UB Blake's family background. One of the most striking things about this book appears, for me at least, right at the beginning, and that's that his parents were enslaved. Um, and so anybody that was born before 1983 has shared a time and space with UB Blake, and to think that within the span of one generation, one can go back to slavery um, is fascinating. At the same time, you're right about how his parents had different attitudes towards race, racial relations, and toward being enslaved. And um, they both imparted these feelings to UB Blake. What, can you tell us something about that? How did he grow up? What were those main events that, that shaped him? Well, I mean, this slide, you see his mother on the left-hand side, his father on the right-hand side. His father actually uh, was enslaved as well as UB really didn't know much about his parents' previous history beyond just what they told him. He was under the impression that his father um, was not from a very, you know, didn't have a lot of uh, wealth. Uh, we actually were able to uncover that after his the period of slavery, he settled in, a, in an area on the eastern shore of Maryland which was uh, known as an independent black community. And actually, the Blake family owned a considerable amount of land. UB was totally unaware of this. Uh, he did talk, his father talked, taught his son to think of people as people and not as black and white. And this was a very important lesson to UB. UB tells a very, he often told a, an anecdote that one day he was coming home from school when he was very young and some white children had thrown rocks at the black children walking by and you became home and said to his father i hate white people and, and his father said no no you shouldn't that's not how you should you know we can't characterize everyone by just a few people that uh, you know carry hate in their hearts and but and his father used to like to show him though however the stripes on his back to emphasize that he had been a slave and had worked himself um out of that. He was actually a stevedore on the Baltimore mm -hmm. docks, which was actually a very dangerous occupation, unloading ships at the time. We, one of the things when I was researching that, that struck me was how many newspaper accounts of injuries that were almost on a daily basis among the stevedores. And, and he was only paid when he was actually working. Yubi's mother was very religious and, and did not want her son to be, as you be said, a piano player. So that's how she pronounced it. And actually, um, but was willing to have an organ in the house because her goal was for you to be a preacher. And uh, another a story you be told about this mother was after the success of Shuffle Along, they had a gala performance in Baltimore. You be arranged for his mother to have a box, which was highly unusual in a white theater. 
uh, and and there was a and a number of what you be called her church lady friends came along, and afterwards a newspaper reporter asked her, "Aren't you proud of your son? His name is up in lights, and isn't this a wonderful achievement?" And she said, "He could have served God instead." So she was a tough tough woman in her own way, but each of them instilled in mm-hmm. you be a very strong sense of. Uh, the importance of black culture and being proud of where he came from and but we're realistic about the limitations of what at that time was a very heavily segregated society yeah and it's 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 such a fascinating you know beginning chapter just to see where he came from and how both of them influenced him and how that um takes it takes place in his later life and how he employed those attitudes to race, you know, knowing what people expected of him, um, but also subverting some expectations and playing with them and never being bitter um, about race, even though he encountered some, you know, some major, um, uh, you know, opposition. Um, I, I specifically like this fact that his mother was willing to have an organ in the house because you talk about how UV expressed a very early interest in music. Um, so basically they got him an organ, he started playing and he was able very quickly to provide substantial funds for his family by playing in what his mother would have considered houses of ill repute. Right, he would sneak out his bedroom window at night and go and play for tips in these houses and come home and uh, his parents didn't really know that this was happening, except that a neighbor woman said, oh, I heard you be playing last night. He had such a distinctive way of playing, even at that early age, that she could recognize it, hearing it through a window. And his mother said, what are you talking about? Yubi is asleep in his bedroom every night. And the jig was up, and his mother was very angry, and his father wasn't happy about it, until Yubi showed him the tips that he had, you know, Mm -hmm. from the customers at the uh, location. And then their objections were tempered because he was making more money than his father at times. In a single night, he was making far more than his father made a week. His father made $9 a week when he was employed. That's incredible. Um, We'll talk about, um, you know, payments and success and what that meant for Black performance throughout Ely Blake's years. Um, I wonder if this is a good um, moment to make a segue toward, um, you know, a little bit fast forward in time because we want to get to shuffle along. But before that, uh, we had a video of Ely Blake playing the Swanee River. And you wanted to show us that because that showcases um, his vaudeville um, training and background. When he he partnered with Noble Sissel, lyricist, and they performed on vaudeville. And in the early 20s, Lee DeForest, some people may have heard of him, a radio pioneer, made some experimental sound films. This one is of UB. And one, a couple of things to to notice in this clip. Uh, Sissel and Blake always appeared in tuxedos on stage on white vaudeville. It was very unusual for black acts to appear, and usually when they did, they um, they had to dress appropriately, which meant in rags. Um, but Cicel and Blake insisted that they were a class act, and so they appeared in classy dress. They did not wear blackface, another thing that a number of people, when they would be about to go on stage, the manager would often say, hey, wait a minute, you don't have makeup on, and they would have to say, no, no, we don't, we don't wear blackface. And in this clip, um, you can also see Yubi's incredible long fingers. He, he was said to be able to reach a 12th, for those of you piano players out there. But it also meant that when he was a young child, his mother said to him, keep your hands in your pockets, because she was afraid that the white people would think he was a pickpocket. So anyway, just watch a little bit of this clip uh, that was made uh, of UB playing Swanee River Variations. From the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C.
this is such a great illustration of, of both his style and, um, and like you said, his long hands and the dress and um, just about, you know, all of the scene um, in here. So shuffling along to shuffle along, um, I would like to to move the conversation to you know Broadway in New York because um, Eva Blake was between Baltimore and New York for a while, um, developing his music, developing his composition. So finally, when Shuffle Along came about, um, you talk about how it was written by two duos, as you say. So um, Miller and Lyles wrote the text, and Eva Blake and Noel Sissel wrote the music. Um, kind of separate from each other, but it all came together. Um, so I definitely want to talk about why this musical was such a success and what the context was. But before that, could we say a little bit about the musical itself? Where did that title come from? What is the storyline? What are the characters? You know, what was the music? Maybe we can just paint a little picture for, um, for our audience as well. Well, uh, Miller and Lyles, who were a, a comedy team, had worked in the Pekin Theater, which was an all-black theater in Chicago. And they had certain sketches uh, that they played as these characters, Sam and Harry, or others. And they used one of the sketches as the basis for Shuffle Long Script. So that was pretty much you know, what you'd expect from black performers uh, writing about an election in the South and uh, then Sissel and Blake were brought in and they created the songs. And luckily everybody got along. And the amazing thing about Shuffle Along was that it succeeded in a completely white theatrical world. And it was, it was a unbelievable success because people didn't expect anything like this. It was shocking for white audiences to hear it ragtime because this was the period of Frimmel and the waltz and operetta. And jazz had not really entered American musical theater at the time, nor did black people with the exception maybe of Burke Williams at the Ziegfeld Follies. Uh, the, the show was produced in a former uh, uh, lecture hall up around Columbus Circle, blocks away from the usual Broadway section and People, there was no expectation for it. And that was the miracle of Shuffle Along, that it was so shocking that that propelled it to become the 10th most popular show on Broadway that season, plays and musicals. So it was a huge success. Yeah, I mean, you know, it was the first musical produced by African Americans, written by African Americans, performed by African Americans, only the comedic leads appeared in blackface, which was a convention of the time that comedians wore blackface, both black and white. Um, but everybody else did not. Uh, and there was such a wide range of characters portrayed from politicians mm -hmm. to, as the song said, undertakers and just ordinary people. And shock of the biggest shock was it portrayed a love story between two black characters in a non-comedic way, which was unheard of. And in fact, the show's, Noble Sissel tells the story on opening night, how everybody was standing near the exits when the uh -huh. big love song was introduced because they thought they would literally be, he said, run back to Harlem. And in fact, instead it was an enormous success. And so everything about this show was, was uh, innovative and new from the staging to the songs uh, to the themes that, that it portrayed. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you want to move a little bit further with the slides at this point yeah. or um, and, and maybe you want to yeah, you know, these, guide us through Miller them. and Lyles, uh, Flournoy Miller on the left, Aubrey Miles on the right. Uh, this is, the, as we said, the only two characters who appeared in blackface. And as Ken said, Miller and Lyles, just like Cecil and Blake, were one of the few black acts that were successful on white vaudeville. At the time, vaudeville was segregated as well. There was a black circuit where people like Ma Rainey and um, Bessie Smith performed. And there was a white circuit where very few black artists, Burt Williams being one, Cecil and Blake being another, and, and Miller and Lyles. So... Um, this is a scene from uh, one of the comic 
one of their big comic routines was a mock fight where they, mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, Flournoy was very tall, Aubrey was very short, uh, and they would um, they would spar with each other, and 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 basically Aubrey could never reach. <laughs> Uh, his partner because of the, you know he could hold him off with the length of his arm. Mm -hmm. um, shall we move on? There we go. So here, here's the title tune, I'm Just Wild About Harry. You can see Lottie G, uh, the woman on the right, who was one of the many women UB uh, had relationships with, shall we say, during the show. And, but you can see the sophistication of of the show with the men and how they're dressed with, you know, the straw hats, the canes. Uh, and we want to say that this was a lecture hall. So everything you can see was pushed forward. The stage had no depth to it. In fact, the, they had to take out the side boxes of the theater to make room for the orchestra. But this led to several innovations. If we can see another slide of the girls, I don't know if that's the next side, slide. Mm -hmm. uh, Shuffle Long introduced the chorus line to musicals because there was no depth. So th these were the first chorus lines in musical theater history. That's a great point. Um, yeah. Do we want to say something about um, the, you know, the complexity of, of theatrical expectations and the historical context and everything? Um, you know, how does one create a show that will appeal to both white and black audiences knowing what was expected of them at the time. And at the same time, you discuss the chorus line specifically in the book. And um, you mentioned how they were selected uh, to appeal to white audiences. Um, well, even black audiences at the time, people may be, uh, this is also an area that's not often discussed, but there was color prejudice in the black audience. And the expectation for um, female performers would be that they would be light skinned. Right. And in fact, when Josephine Baker auditioned. I was just about to ask about that, yeah. Yeah, she auditioned for the original Shuffle Along. Noble Sissel said, oh no, you're too dark. Um, and uh, ironically, um, she, of course, went on to become one of the most successful, if not the most successful, alumna of the show, but she wasn't brought in until after the Broadway run, or midway through the Broadway run, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, so, and she was, if you can see on the end on this photo, there's one woman who's not dressed in chorus wear. That's not Josephine Baker, but she basically played the end role, which was comedic. And, and a lot of people don't know this about Josephine Baker either, was that she was not a sex symbol in the United States. She became one in France where she was considered exotic and and the french were much more less color prejudiced but in a, but in shuffle along she was the breakout comedy star and that was another telling detail because she had dark skin mm -hmm. and another thing you can tell from the photos the previous one of miller and lyles you saw there was a painted backdrop and most of the scenery came from other shows and a lot of the costumes came from other shows also so it wasn't a class A production, so to speak. And, uh, you There's know- There's a lot of improvisation because I think you talk about costumes being donated and, and like right. almost rewriting the story to fit what they had to wear. <laughs> exactly. And the shows downtown, were, you know, the operettas were quite lavish, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, you know, Ziegfeld Follies, they were huge painted drops and gorgeous showgirls and all. And this had no, none of that, but it had the spirit and the life that the other shows downtown did not have. And for white audiences, it was a revelation. And of That's course, I, I'm just wild about Harry. Uh, there's a little excerpt of that on this slide. That's probably I was just about to say, maybe we yeah. can play that and you can tell yeah. us how it's that- the most famous, it's probably mm -hmm. the, among the most famous songs. Uh, luckily, when Harry Truman ran for president in 1948, it was revived. And so it was the gift that kept giving. It's not the key romantic ballad, which was called Love Will Find a Way. It was more of a jazz dance number. And that's what this number, and again, you can see Lottie G. She was famous for her very fancy gowns and clothing, totally working against um, 
the stereotype of the day. Um, and, uh, and as Ken noted, the young men all kind of dandified who were dancing with her to this tune. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, maybe we can play a little bit of it. So people will certainly recognize this theme, I right. think. <laughs> One thing about this photo is. Uh, yeah. Interesting thing about this was it was written as a wall. Maybe it was a beautiful wall. So it was waltzes. And so it was restaged as a ragtime number. Uh, but originally, UBN intended it to be the kind of, as Ken was saying, the kind of operatic waltz that you would have heard in a, in a show by Fremel. That's interesting. Ken, you wanted to say something about the image? Oh, yeah. The image itself. Uh, the, this is UB Blake's actual photo that he had. And the, the writing at the top is, is his labeling of the photo. Mm -hmm. He did a show called American Musical Theater on television uh, that was a CBS educational show in the 60s. And he was a guest and brought all his photos and they were never given back to him. Years later, when the producer died, myself and some other people went to the woman's house and we found first all the videotapes of the show, but also all of UB's photos she had saved. And uh, so they'll be going to the Maryland Historical Society soon. Thank you. That's, a, that's an incredible find, an incredible news. Uh, yeah, would you this like to just say? Just a little advertisement piece for mm -hmm. along showing how successful it was. It ran for two years, over 500 performances, which as Ken can tell you, is a, a, an incredible run for that day. Most shows ran under 100 performances. Yeah, 200 maybe, you know. If they were a big success, but 500 was unheard of. And then they embarked on a tour. Another thing that you had asked where the name Shuffle Along came from, nobody mm -hmm. knows for sure, but Will Marion Cook, who was in the Shuffle Along Orchestra, very famous African-American composer uh, and friend of UB's, had written a song called Swing Along which was considered to be sort of the black national anthem. It was a song about freedom and, and uh, the possibility of um, improved life once uh, after the Civil War. And it, it's still performed. It's a, it's a pretty popular choral piece. And I think Yumi and, uh, and uh, Sissel may have been influenced uh, in choosing that title as a play off that, the earlier swing along. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, I thought we had another audio file here. Maybe we want to play that. Sorry. Yeah, here's the full chorus line. This is, I think, Bandana Days. I'm not sure. <laughs> Let's see. It might be Shuffle Along. Yeah. Everyone in town is always singing shuffle the along. song. Shuffle Along, Shuffle Along. Doctors, bakers, undertakers, do us stand? Stand full of pep and think of patience. Shuffle along and whistle a song. Life's but a chance, and when time comes to choose, if you lose, don't start singing the blues, but just shuffle along. And you could hear a little uh, sand dancing there. Shuffle along had a lot of different dance styles in it uh, and actually was sort of somewhat pre-tap uh, when it was re when the it wasn't exactly a revival but when the show was put on on Broadway about Shuffle Along a couple of years ago by George C. Wolf almost all the dancing was tap and and it, purists were very upset about that <laughs> because it actually was more pre more like sand dancing or shuffling, which you just heard mm -hmm. that in that clip. And here you can see the backdrop, which is a generic painted backdrop that was rented out to vaudeville companies, you know, theater companies. So it was very inexpensive production. And the producer was John Court, who was a white producer. The Court Theater in New York City is named after him. And he took a chance on this black show when no one else expected anything of it. And the success of it 
was all due be, because there was no expectation at all. It was hardly even noticed in the newspapers of the time. All of a sudden, it sort of blew up on the stage and became a, a sleeper hit. Right. And I was I was also fascinated by how you described the context in which it appeared um, just historically. So it's immediately after the First World War, um, black veterans are coming from Europe. Um, there is racial upheaval because they expect more um, than they're receiving back home. At the same time, it's 1921. We're going into the roaring 20s. Um, so there are, you know, white audiences expecting stereotypical portrayal, portrayals of black characters. And there are black audiences expecting non-stereotypical portrayals because they want to move past it. And then there are, you know, progressive um, audiences um, everywhere. Uh, wanting to see new things and wanting to, to see Broadway move past the Alpharetta and the Waltz, like you said, the uh, enamored with the ragtime. Um, my question about, is this one of those improvised uh, costume scenes where they had to change or what can, what do we know about this image? This was the opening of the second act. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the fellow in front is, was named Bob Cook and he was an eccentric dancer. Again, that was sort of a uh, term of the time. It meant he did things like what people would think of today, like snake hips, or even even if you've seen break dancing, you know, they, some of those kinds of moves. Or Ray Bolger was an eccentric dancer. If yeah. you think of him as the scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz. Right. Great and point. so the, this, I don't know if this scene, again, they, they borrowed costumes. They're sort of old plant, play on the old plantation. That's what I noticed. They would dress yeah. differently than in the other, but, but you know, chorus line. It's supposed to be an urban scene. Of they're crossing this, you know, this is supposed to be like a crowd on the New York streets. You can see Lottie G to um, Bob's left there. I don't know if Adelaide Hall is in this picture. Another thing to mention about Shuffle Long was the many, many black artists who appeared in it, like Josephine Baker. We mentioned Florence Mills, who became one of the biggest stars and tragically died very young. Um, Paul Robeson for a while uh, as, uh, as a member of a quartet. He sang bass. Uh, and supposedly, according to UB, he had never been on stage before, so he fell off the front of the stage. <laughs> another another testimony, as, ten, as Ken said, to the fact that it wasn't a very deep stage. Right. Um, and um, many, many others um, uh, got their start in Shuffle Along, and Shuffle Along, as you might imagine, inspired a host of imitators. And one of the things we discuss in the book is how ironic it is that here's this amazing big hit. Cecil and Blake are the toast of Broadway. They're the toast of Harlem. They're, you know, extremely well-to-do. Um, and because they had been producers of the show, which was, again, unheard of at the time. And yet, when they tried to do their next show, which they felt would you know, was going to be much more grandly staged and even more of a quote unquote legitimate Broadway show, they got tremendous blowback from critics who, you know, were uh, less than sympathetic to the idea of black artists trying to encroach on what they viewed as white territory. And in fact, there was a big hit song of the day inspired by their success called, um, it's getting dark on old Broadway, which was kind of humorous, but also kind of mm -hmm. <laughs> insulting. Uh, UB actually, in later life, spoke of it as, as a testimony to their success, which again is kind of interesting in terms of how he related to it. But it certainly uh, expressed the anxiety of white Broadway. And I think Ken also You've often commented that of all the song composers of the time who were successful on Broadway, who were invited out to Hollywood, none of the black composers were. Did right. Ken want to add anything or? Yeah, uh, uh, one person who was, you know, there were other bootleg, let's say, versions of Shuffle Along touring the country. And uh, one of them, uh, in one of them was Nat King Cole, at an early age. And most of these shows uh, were fly-by-night affairs and he and the company were stranded 
out west, and that's how he got out west and started his career. But from Shuffle Along, he moved on. That's really interesting. That's a great piece of information from history. Um, so imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, is what we're saying here. So. Yeah. This what is are we the, seeing here? Yeah, this is a piece of sheet music from their vaudeville days. But one of the things you have to understand that the we have this contemporary idea of the book musical where there's a coherent story, whereas Shuffle Along was really more, as Ken said, a series of routines. And the mm -hmm. whole thing ground to a halt in the second act, and Cecil and Blake would come out and do their vaudeville act for like nine minutes. And believe me, that was one of the most popular features of the show. And this was one of the songs they performed. I don't remember what the audio clip is, but we might want to listen to a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. It might be Bandana Days, I'm not sure. <laughs> That's probably this number was probably associated with that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if we have yeah any more uh, long slides. Ken, do you want to talk about? Well, this? this is at the time panoramic photos were taken of full casts of Broadway shows, usually on tour and mainly in Atlantic City. But here we have it at the Selwyn Theater in Boston. So the tour. Look how many people are in this cast. You have no Broadway show today that has this many people on stage. This is just the cast. It's not the crew, the orchestra. It's just the cast people. And they're playing a white theater. And when Shuffle Along toured, there was a big question about whether white uh, theaters could play a Black show and should Black people be allowed to attend performances with white audiences. And... Shuffle Along really led the way to the desegregation uh, of shows while they toured, while they toured. After That's incredible. You, you do mention, so yeah, you do mention that ripple effect of, you know, Black audiences having to sit in the balcony and white audiences sitting in the orchestra and the orchestra line being moved to include Black audiences. In, right, in little Broadway, by little. But, but it was other locations too, you're saying. Right. But... Um, for example, when Porgy and Bess toured, uh, the, the National Theater in Washington was not, was still segregated. And um, Todd Duncan, who played Porgy, he said on the tour, we are not playing any segregated theaters. You have to have black people allowed. So between Shuffle Long and Porgy and Bess, it sort of slipped back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, there were, we found newspaper advertisements. They'd be touring. They never, the main company never toured south of Washington, which is interesting. There was a number two company that toured the south, but they ran newspaper ads in advance of like, if they were going to Little Rock, there'd be an ad in the paper saying, you know, black theater actors looking for lodging, because they couldn't stay in white hotels. This is a picture of the actual Shuffle Along Orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, you can see William Grant still in there is holding the oboe, uh, second or second from the my left in the front row, and you can see UB at the piano, and again they're all in tuxedos. And you'll also notice it's it's um, reeds and horn heavy. There seems to be one violin and a bass, but this was a jazz score, so the Broadway shows wouldn't even have a trumpet you know, and for Frimmel and Romberg and all those, they were completely violin scores, but this was a real jazz band. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, okay, so I think we're moving um, along toward, like I said, there's eight more chapters after Shuffle Along, and I know we wanted to celebrate the anniversary. So, you know, we talked about Shuffle Along for, um, for a while here, but there are 60 more years of UB Blake's life after, this incredible musical. Um, and as people can see from my background here, it ends with a happy ending. Um, that's why I wanted to include that one, um, a curtain call later in his life. But some of your chapters actually use the terms hard times and lean times. So, you know, what can we say in 
a few minutes about UB Blake between, you know, Shuffle Along and, uh, and you know, the 80s. Well, I think one thing that was so impressive to us about UB, this is a picture of him with Noble Sissel presenting to Margaret Truman, the score of I'm Just Wild About Harry for the Truman Library. But one thing that, you know, UB never stopped learning, never stopped listening. It was tough. I mean, the Depression certainly hit all black artists. It hit every, everyone in the arts, but black artists probably the most. And um, to get opportunities to actually compose for the stage were, were very, very, it was very tough. And UB, for a while, led his own dance band. He did, he did other things. He always kept composing. And one of the things that impressed me was when he was in his 60s, Right after World War II, he went back to school at NYU Night School to study the Schillinger method, which was a pretty advanced music theory method that Gershwin had used. And here's UB later in life. Again, you can see that enormous reach of, mm -hmm. him, of his hands. Um, he had to play in these whorehouses with no drummer, uh, no bass player. So he's, he developed a very strong left arm. Uh, <laughs> Which is what ragtime is, yeah. Right, in fact. To emulate the orchestra. Mm -hmm. Right, and here's a scene from uh, later in life, there was a show called UB that was staged on Broadway. Somewhat problematic in that, just like every other show UB was involved with, he wasn't paid what he was supposed to be paid, but nonetheless, it's the show that, that introduced Maurice and Gregory Hines to Broadway. Mm -hmm. They had not previously there been in VR. Gregory on the left and Maurice on the right behind UB on stage. And uh, UB's second career was sort of launched in 1969 when John Hammond invited him, very famous record producer who discovered, as he liked to say, everyone from Bessie Smith to Bob Dylan. He invited UB to make a two record set, which was called the 86 years of UB Blake. And UB, when he got there, they they wanted him to use this sort of uh, standard piano in the Columbia studio. And there was this big baby grand nearby. And he said, why can't I use that? I piano? Want that one, yeah. And they said, well, that's Horowitz's piano. Only Horowitz plays that piano. And Yubi said, well, that's the one I'm going to play. And ironically, his left hand was so strong, he broke a bass string. Uh, <laughs> we do talk know, about I, that in the book. Is there anything Ken would like to add at this point? I have one final question before I invite our audience members to, you know, submit their questions, and I'd like to get there um, and, and, you know, touch on as many of them as I can. Um, Ken, did you want to add anything? Well, I wanted to say that even though UB, which was sort of, um, it came right after Ain't Misbehaving, let's put it that way, uh, that even when UB was a hit and started touring. Sissel and Blake got screwed out of royalties. So they were still being taken advantage of by the white management. Not that black management might be different, but uh, they just couldn't catch a break with their shows. That's a great point because that brings me to, to my last question that I'm hoping we can um, address before the Q&A, which is, um, I had this pervasive feeling throughout the book um, about how you, you discuss the entertainment industry as you know being inherently exploitative of everybody, um, particularly black artists at the time, um, because every other you know social upheaval would add to that exploitation. Um, at the same time, you mentioned quite early in the book that UB Blake, um, having started playing so early and making, uh, you know, making a living almost for himself and his family uh, so early, he never had to take on a manual job. So there is a sense of, you know, the exploitation of the entertainment industry, and at the same time, uh, a sense of opportunity for black artists. Yeah, I mean, this is the this is the yin and yang of, of studying popular music, uh, and. There are many, many artists you could say this about. I mean, on the one hand, UB was uh, one of the only black artists admitted into ASCAP in 1923 when Shuffle Along was so successful. On the other hand, his ASCAP rate would never changed. Uh, ASCAP sort of rates their composers, and that's how you would get more of the revenue. And, uh, and who changed it for him? 
while Yubi's second wife had worked <laughs> for the publisher and songwriter W.C. Handy, one of the most canny uh, songwriters around. Handy was a, had his own publishing operation. And Yubi's second wife, after she married him, the song, as I said, I'm Just Wild About Harry, became a big hit. It was the first song recorded after World War II. Tremendous success. Uh, and uh, yet his ASCAP rate remained unchanged. And she was the one who went to ASCAP and brought up the fact mm -hmm. that this wasn't fair. But I mean, again, you know, it's kind of, this is a, a situation that unfortunately is often told when you dig into stories in popular music history that artists were treated poorly all around, but black artists, I mean, white artists were under contract by the song publishers and they got a stipend, you know, just to provide songs as they wrote them. That never happened with black artists. After World War II, UB had to record his own acetates to promote his songs. And so, you know, there was just, it was a di <laughs> different. And I'm sorry to say, I'm not sure it's changed that much today mm -hmm. as you can read in contemporary stories of artists who get started out and then uh, are not really treated very well. Right. Um, I see Margot on our screen, which makes me say welcome back. What do you have for us at this point? Thank you. Thank you, Martina. And thank you, Richard and Ken. I'm just um, saying, please, I'm inviting the audience again, like you did, to submit your question for Martina, Richard, and Ken by using the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can place your questions in here, and we're going to try to get to them. Um, Ken and Richard also will see your questions after the program. So if you put them in there, that's the right place to put them. Um, while I give you like a, one more second to submit your questions, I would like to take this opportunity again to thank you for attending the program today. This is our last one, our last um, FSK from home program in the series for spring, and we will resume in the fall. Um, we again just want to thank you for any little donation that you can provide for us today. We really do value it here at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. I value your donation and my colleagues at MCHC value your generosity as well. So you can donate now with the link in the chat and these funds directly support our costs for putting on these free programs. So we are very grateful, and I see that there are quite a few uh, questions coming in the Q&A, so I'm going to hand it back over to Martina to squeeze a couple of them in. Thank you, Margo. I appreciate that. Um, before we start with the questions, we have one comment that says, um, it's from our friend Vicki. Um, it says, thank you for this program. I had the pleasure of working with UB Blake in the 1978 production of UB. It was a life-changing experience for me. Um, thank you so much, Vicki, for, for sharing that. Um, so we have about five minutes. Let's get to the questions. Uh, our friend Sam says, you mentioned there was a distinction between white and black vaudeville circuits. Are there further resources you'd recommend with lists of black vaudeville venues? There, there's a number of books. If you go to Abe Books and look and just- Oh, that's one in, of my favorite sites. That's right. Yeah, yeah, and put in um, Black Theaters, Black Vaudeville. There are, there are a lot of books on this. They're all published by um, these, uh, they're not really, uh, they're not usually distributed books that you'll find in bookstores. They're, you know, but there's a lot of them and they're really great. And we um, use a lot of them as research, but you can find them all used on Abe Books. And we can also, I, I just wanted to mention to our audience that when we send uh, the follow-up uh, email after this with the recording, you know, edited recording of this program, we usually include resources. So uh, we can certainly add some of yeah, those in Elijah, that email. Our, our buddy Elijah Wall just mentioned the Seraph books. They're great. Uh, they're, they're drawn from mostly newspaper accounts. I was gonna say the Black Vaudeville Circuit was known as T-O-B-A, which Black said stood for Tough on Black Asses. And it was the 
uh, the sort of the parallel universe to the white circuits of the day. So there are there's quite a bit of documentation of those circuits. There's an entire book on the history of the Pekin Theater, which Ken mentioned. And you can find these all in the bibliography of our book, which, by the way, you can buy through the Historical Society, which, by the way, will help them as well, because they'll make a little money selling it. So um, thank you, Richard. You want my job? <laughs> you do it really well. <laughs> um, and moving along, uh, so let me just skip to some other questions uh, from a friend, Brian. Was Jimtown supposed to represent Harlem? No, it was more of a, a town in the sticks, as they would say. You know, wow. it was a farming town or you know a mm -hmm. small town of the time. It wasn't. It had nothing to do with Harlem. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then from your friend Elijah, like you mentioned, I saw Earl Hines bring Blake on stage to do a guest spot, and he spoke of Blake as his mentor. Did you come across anything about their relationship? Yes, in fact, when Shuffle Along went to Pittsburgh, uh, UB was introduced to the Hines family. Earl Hines' mother was a big figure in the local black community, a very well-connected person, and she introduced UB to her son, and in fact, Yubi said to him, heard him play the piano and, and said to Earl, if you're still here next year when I come through, I'm going to beat you up. <laughs> he, was, he was like, get out of Pittsburgh. You're too good to, uh, to be here. And when Earl went to Chicago, he actually wrote to Yubi in, uh, in the early, late 20s, early 30s, looking for work in New York, which, of course, by then... The, the whole world had collapsed because of the Depression. But, um, yeah, UB was also a big mentor to James B. Johnson um, and to other younger pianists of the period. Even late in life, Mike Lipskin and other people, mm -hmm. you know, were taught by UB. William Balkan. Right. Here are two questions. One is from an anonymous um, attendee and one is from Judith, but I think they could be maybe grouped together and maybe we can also address them in the resources part of our second email. Um, are there any films of the big dance numbers from Shuffle Along? And is there a version of Shuffle Along you'd recommend? Hint, hint. <laughs> so uh, Richard can, there's no recordings of, of uh, the dances, I don't think, right, Richard? No, there's but, no film. There's a, another short film that Lee DeForest made of Cecil and Blake performing. There are short films of Miller and Lyles, but oddly, uh, because of the content, the copyright owners will not release them. Uh, so they're not available to the public, sadly. Uh, Miller went on to be, uh, you, some of you may have heard of Amos and Andy, the radio act. That was a copy of Miller and Lyles, and somewhat ironically, Miller ended up writing for Amos and Andy for many years. And um, you can see, if you've seen the film Stormy Weather, there's an uncredited sequence with Flournoy Miller and uh, I think it's Manton Moreland uh, doing a routine that's similar to what Miller and Lyles would have done. The Broadway revival that was done by Wolf um, had totally different choreography and well, none of the choreography survives, so no one really knows what the original choreography was. But, as we mentioned earlier, there is the record that Ken and I uh, annotated, which is of the original recordings that were made at the time. They didn't do cast albums, but uh, made at the time of the original show. And we should also say Richard and I did a sequel uh, to the Shuffle Long called Shuffle Long of 1950, when Cecil and Blake kept trying to revive versions of Shuffle Along all through their career. And, and there was going to be one in 1950 with Pearl Bailey and then 1952 and the sets burned down and it was, it never happened. But there is this, that second recording too, which also has liner notes by Richard Carlin and Ken Bloom. Awesome, that's perfect. Um, I think we only have time for one last question, but we will forward all of your questions um, to um, Richard and Ken, and hopefully in that follow-up email, uh, we can address um, some of this. Uh, we're getting a lot of interest here, and that makes me very happy. 
uh, a question from our friend Cassandra. I think that would be great to close with. Um, did any of Mr. Blake's descendants go into theater or music? He, he uh, there was someone who uh, I met at the York Theater who I think was claimed to be a nephew of Yubi's in some way. Yeah, Yubi had no direct descendants. He had no children. Yeah. Uh, he, he was supposedly the youngest of 11 children, none of whom survived, according to him. His parents did adopt a daughter. Yubi doesn't usually talk very much about her. Uh, and she had descendants. And so there are some indirect descendants, but there are no direct descendants of Yubi's um, currently around. All right. Thank you, Richard and Ken. I enjoy this conversation so much, and I think we could fill a whole other hour just talking about this. Um, but you know, what we can recommend is the book because it will definitely keep you um, interested. I could not, you know, let it go from start to finish. The story is incredible. It covers a hundred years of you know this artist's life and and a hundred years of our history. Um, so I appreciate you being here and sharing your insights with us. Well, thank you, Mar Margo, Martina. It was great. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Margo. Thank you so much. Thank you both, really, very, very so much. Uh, you truly have been such a pleasure to work with, and um, we just thank you so much. <laughs> so I, we do have to end our program here. Like Martina said, we will send out a recording um, in a separate email to all the registrants, and we will put it on our social media and our website. And um, please go out and buy their book from our museum shop or from your local, your local bookstore. And thank you all for joining us today. Everyone in town is always singing the song. Shuffle along, shuffle along. Doctors, bakers, undertakers do a step. They're full of pep and think of patience. Shuffle along. And whistle a song Life's but a chance And when time comes to choose If you lose Don't start singing the blues But just shuffle along And whistle a song